They can march as long as they want, as long as they pay their taxes. Al Haig said it in 1982 at a million person march calling for disarmament at the United Nations. They can march and protest and resist for as long as they want, is the attitude, as long as they continue to pay their taxes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leslie Manning. I'm a member of the Religious Society of Friends, known to the world as Quakers. And as you've heard from Jenny, I have the great honor of serving on the discernment committee for the main War Tax Resistance Resource Center. This afternoon's panel is focused on not the how of war tax resistance or the why of war tax resistance, but the what if. What if our federal budget, what if our state and local budgets accurately reflected the wishes and the aspirations of the people who pay those taxes. We've invited them to come today and speak from their unique perspectives of immigration, climate justice, and grassroots activism with a concern for education, with a concern for healthcare, for, with a concern for international peace and disarmament. We regret to say that our Buddhist friend Peter could not be here today representing the Poor People's Campaign, but I will do my best to try and infuse some of the values of this national call for a moral revival based on the teachings of Doc, Dr. Martin Luther King as we wrap up this afternoon. I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and spend a couple of minutes talking about why they are called to do their work. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is George Fudagu Makoko. I'm originally from DRC Congo. DRC Congo and I've lived here for the last 16 years and I'm a father of two, a boy and a girl, 10 and 6, married to a beautiful woman. And, uh, I've been here and I love men. I'm Bob Klotz. I live in South Portland. Um, by formal profession, I am a physician assistant. Uh, I've been working in healthcare for 40, over 40 years now. And I primarily work now in trauma and addiction. Uh, and there's uh, very much a link for me um, with that, those issues in our society beyond uh, just the drug addiction uh, world that I live in. Uh, but it's, it's the socio-economic realities that have deep impacts. And in 2011, I uh, co-founded 350 Maine, which is a state um, group associated, aligned with 350.org, the international uh, climate change, the climate justice organization. So um, when I talked to Jenny, I said, Jenny, I'm not, I, I, I don't really uh, resist paying taxes, so I, 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 am, I, am I okay to be on the panel? And the reality is that I do very intentionally uh, honor those who, who have the courage to do that, um, but I do very intentionally keep my income low and try to keep things uh, in integrity as best I can. Uh, but again, I really appreciate the ability to consider these things with all of you today. My name is Lisa Savage. I'm a school teacher. I'm from Solon, Maine. My husband and I have been involved in several uh, campaigns here in Maine to resist the militarization of society, including being uh, war tax resistors. And um, I am interested to talk about a campaign that many of the people in this room worked on uh, to resist a piece of state legislation that was giving a, a corporate tax giveaway to a big weapons manufacturer here in Maine. That's not usually what I think of when I hear the phrase war tax resistance, but I guess it's a form of it. So um, thank you for inviting me.
So it will not come as a surprise, I think, to many in this room, but perhaps it will surprise our viewers to learn that more than half of the money that we pay in federal taxes, currently estimated to be about 53% or 53 cents of every dollar, goes to war, past, present, and future. The gross domestic product of the state of Maine is 10% reliant on defense contracting and military procurement. That's an extraordinarily high number. We know that Congress makes it a point to spread the wealth, if you will, or spread the pork across every state. But there are very few states that have as large a percentage of their overall state economy as a result of these contracts. And when we talk about these contracts, we're not obviously just talking about the Bath Iron Works, General Dynamics contracts for naval destroyers. We're also talking about things like Martins Point Healthcare, a large employer here in Portland, a private healthcare provider that has the contracts, for example, for military retirees and their families. So the insidiousness of this distribution of our money back to the state results in the return of federal tax dollars at a rate of almost five to one. That is to say, for every one dollar a Mainer spends on federal taxes, we get almost five dollars back in contracts and services. So we are truly addicted. We are truly held in thrall by these contracts and by the choices that our elected representatives make. We are less than two weeks away from the election, the midterm elections, that determines who goes to Congress and who goes to the state legislature and allocates our money. What would this state look like? What indeed would this nation look like? And how would the world be changed if they, our elected representatives, actually voted according to what we choose as our priorities. That's the question we're putting to our panelists today. What would Maine look like? What would the country look like if we were not allocating 53 cents of every tax dollar to war? We're going to invite George to speak first. As you can hear, he's not originally from here. He's from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. He has some knowledge of what the effect of war and constant violence does to a people and to families. Welcome, Georgia. Thank you. Uh, let me start by thanking Jeannie first for inviting me when I received the email and asking me to be here, I firmly said that I will be there because I like to be here and where people are discussing about ideas. So I sincerely thank you for inviting me. And also I'm thanking you for you taking your time and being here. Uh, when I was thinking about coming here yesterday, I, I was reminded about one of the great sayings of uh, Socrates the philosopher uh, who say that great spirits, and this is says in French, I was reading that in French, and said that the great spirits discusses about uh, ideas, but the median spirit discusses about events, but the lowest spirits discuss about, about other people, or just talking about other people. So there's many other places I would like to be than a place where we are discussing about ideas of tax and 
and accountability for the government and, and what we can do to make sure the priorities are uh, set and we are meeting them. So I, I thank you for being here. I take this dearly and uh, thank you for your participation and also coming here. So I will, uh, Jeannie had asked me to talk about the connection between war, immigration, and also the US military budget. But I think the last one, uh, I'm not expert and I don't think I'll say much about it other than just giving you some facts about the, uh, the US military budget. But I'm going to talk more about the war and immigration. So the term war, you all know, it. it's a conflict between uh, two parties or one nation against another. A simple concept, and you all know it. But probably one thing that I'm going, to, I'm going to talk more about is experiencing the war. An average, so 40, it is estimated that 45,000 people are, die in the DRC Congo every month, an average, as a result of the conflict. Uh, how many, so you're talking about 48 women who are raped every hour. So when that, the situation of war occurred in any country, what would be the first reflex of every human being? So running out of the country. And you run as far as you can, and making sure that the next destination you are safe. And there's no way, no better way of explaining this than just probably, I always talking uh, to people and saying that you should walk in the shoes of immigrants that you see around here now. Some of the people that you see are people who are stable, like you and I, working every day, providing for their families, have made some investments, have a house, have, have a job, a retirement account, but suddenly when the war strikes, they have to run and leave behind everything they have owned for a very long time and work very hard. So when they run out, some will end up coming here in the US. And thus the number of immigrants that you see from Africa, have, most of them have, have fled from the conflict in different countries. So they are here trying to establish and start all over their lives again, and it's very hard. So that's the just telling you a little bit about immigration and the war. And how does, who perpetrate this war and the conflict? Those are people who are competing for power, very ambitious people who knows that when they have access to power, they are able to manipulate, they are able to explore, they are able to get rich and richer and keep on living and being on power. But they also have, those are the internal power competing and fighting, but there's also external power, either supporting militias or supporting one group that are fighting in a country. And that's where you see superpower countries like US has also played some roles in the conflict around the world. And I can go on and tell you some examples, but I'm not, just so for the sake of time, I'll, I'll just stop there. So, that's the situation of a war and the immigration. It's a very related. You've heard about the pushback factor of immigration, right? Some of them is war, the poverty. When war strikes, there's a poverty that's come, coming in. But also now people are looking somewhere else they can start their lives. So briefly, that's what uh, myself, when I grew up in the Congo, uh, when I, after completing high school, because of the wars was starting in the Congo, I moved to Rwanda, and I lived there for seven years. After that, I came here in the U.S. And I cannot tell you how much I've lost and how much I have to the effort that I've made to start all over my life again. It's a very, very hard. So to uh, about the the. U.S. military, what we're talking about, the budgets. It's, when I was reading, I was just shocked about how much is spent or invested in the military defense. How many people know how much the budget for this year over the, over the defense? 717. Yes, exactly right. 
$700 billion, more than $700 billion. That's, so from last year, 2017, it was $610 billion. So just to put this into perspective, U.S. budget, military defense budget, is a 40% of the world, world budget. So 40% of the whole entire world is budget. To be precise, it's a three more than three percent of the GDP, GDP, the U.S. GDP, which is about nineteen trillion dollars. But the GDP, but for three percent of that is allocated to the defense budget. But I just so then you think about, wow, that's a lot of money. So education is not priority. Like you, I like the flyer that you made, where you put down the healthcare, education. And they put some taxpayer in the middle carrying all the load of, of the budget. And the one thing that is so sad is that people don't realize that we are the one funding those uh, war activities around the world. They don't realize that. So you are among the few people who are aware that you can do something about it. But they don't realize that every dollar that I don't take home goes to the tax and the way that the money, uh, the taxes go. To this activity. So, just so you know, there's something that we can do. First, as a recommendation, as I conclude, probably not gonna, but avoid war in any way you can. I pray that in my lifetime I will never have to experience war again. I have the kids and I worry very much about, like, imagine if you have to live with your kids crying and getting sick and finding yourself into a a refugee camp and living there for many years and you have no way of really, of supporting your family and people are feeding you where you used to feed your family yourself and provide for your family. So thank you for being here but also I hope this is our eye opening and that you can do more, invite more people to come and have this discussion. Thank you. Well, I also appreciate uh, Jenny's effort and everyone else uh, to make it today. Um, I can fall prey to looking at any weather event and relating it to climate change and the different impacts. And today is a pretty stormy day, and we've had some pretty stormy times. So, in the world of what if, um, I think for me, with regard to climate change and the relationship to the war machine. If we weren't spending 53 cents of every dollar on the military, we wouldn't have as much climate change <laughs> as we have. Um, but I think, again, our society is very car-oriented, uh, very uh, industrial agricultural-oriented, and very comfort-oriented. And so, um, but the reality is, as the primary emitter of carbon and an enormous and the primary user of fossil fuels, the military has, has a dramatic impact. Um, uh, this woman to my left has been a, an inspiration with her work and her access to resources and her voice around these issues. So uh, I, I've never been much of a, even in my medicine, I'm more of a, help me understand how you feel guy than a numbers guy. So I don't, I don't have a lot of data. Uh, there's a few things I'd like to share. Um, but the one article uh, that Lisa had shared uh, a file with me was titled, Is Climate the Worst Casualty of War? And the first paragraph is, how do you clear a room of climate activists? Start talking about war. And I've had that experience, others in this room have had this experience. It's shocking to me that people who otherwise would seem progressive and liberal and sensitive to these impacts, again, largest emitter of carbon, uh, largest user of fossil fuels in the world, why are we not talking about military? Uh, I confronted this, I, I'm currently not as active on a day-to-day -day basis with uh, 350 Maine. Uh, still, those people who, who are on a daily basis are very much my friends, but when I approached them about the LD-1781 uh, battle, it was like it was nuclear. Uh, and we saw that, and it continues to be a conversation, which is sort of really the more optimistic beginning and ending of what I want to say is, much like my experience with Occupy, 
which for me, um, 350 Maine was a very intentional working group extension of Occupy. It's about the conversation. Those conversations are difficult. And for me, the answer to uh, how do we keep those climate activists in the room is we have to find ways to continue to engage in conversation. So when, when my friends turn to me and say, the very first thing they said to me is, what's the position of the unions at BIW on this bill? And that was true for a number of other groups that I was in communication back during that uh, campaign. And, uh, you know, I think that's an important question. But it, 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 the conversation oftentimes doesn't go beyond that. People are just too anxious about taking on this issue. People are too anxious about resisting paying their taxes. People are too uh, anxious about what it would really mean uh, to resist the war. So, um, so, a lot there, I did want to share, sorry about that bang, the Pentagon uses more petroleum per day than the aggregate consumption of 175 countries out of the 210 countries in the world, and it generates more than 70% of this nation's total greenhouse gas emissions. This is based on uh, CIA World uh, Factbook. The U.S. Air Force burns through 2.4 billion gallons of jet fuel a year, all of it derived from oil. Uh, and since the start of the post-9-1-1 wars, U.S. military fuel consumption has averaged about 144 million barrels annually. Now again, those numbers, I don't spend a lot of time with numbers because the perspective gets lost, but it's dramatic. It's dramatic. We, you know, when we, what got me engaged around uh, early 350 main development was the Alberta tar sands. And that was referred to as the carbon bomb, which is just dwarfed by these numbers. If we're talking about a carbon bomb, it's the military. Um, and we were able to engage hundreds of thousands of people to take on the Alberta tar sands, but it is a heavy lift to take on something that just feels just impossible to push back on when it comes to the military. We've also, again, in our uh, communities, it's been very difficult to take on the impact of, of agriculture uh, on, on climate, which is enormous. So again, how we have these conversations, especially in these days when facts don't matter and conversations take too long. Um, so there is also a bit of a mixed message out there. Uh, just a year ago, uh, Defense Secretary Mattis said, we do believe in climate change. It is a risk. Uh, it is a security risk. Uh, the military is attempting to attend at times. Uh, to the realities that Norfolk will be underwater, um, has already been affected adversely by uh, rising sea levels. Um, and, but, you know, but then we know the other voice of the administration negates it, denies it, etc. Uh, I was very excited, there was an article back in Mother Jones, way back in 2013, about the Green Navy. Uh, and it spoke about how they, under the Obama administration, had started to convert to biofuels. Um, most of the uh, fuels that the military use are cheap and basically jet fuel or some variation of diesel. Um, but they, they had made some very significant commitments, I'll just read here, um, that they had uh, committed to uh, increasing better fuel efficiency, uh, deploying, not just demonstrating, a great green fleet carrier strike group. I'm not supporting the, this military activity, I'm just speaking to, there was an attempt to speak to climate change uh, by the military. Phasing in hybrid fuel and electric vehicles to have petroleum use in the Navy by 2015, requiring that each, uh, by 2020, each base, the Navy owns 2.2 million acres of land plus 65,000 uh, buildings, be at least 50% self-powered by renewables like solar, wind, and wave, wave energy, and on and on. Now, I don't, honestly, I did not have the ability to see where those things stand now, but there was an effort to uh, negate the military's impact. Um, and my guess is it's been stalled or, or reversed, and again, some others may be able to speak more accurately um, or in more detail. 
The other thing is, I remember years ago, I mean, this was like in the 90s, there was, I still have it in my basement, there's a VHS videotape from the American Petroleum Institute that says that basically the premise was, we don't believe in climate change, but if it's true, it's actually not that bad. We'll have warmer weather, we'll have longer growing seasons, et cetera, et cetera. And again, another Mother Jones article, 15 big name corporations that plan to make money off the climate crisis. And for me, as you look through that list, defense and border surveillance, companies making money off of this, uh, related to climate change, security from social unrest, monitoring, responding to, and rebuilding from extreme weather, shipping lanes and travel. You know, there was, what was it, three years ago now, uh, Angus King and a submarine uh, surfacing at the Arctic uh, because we have got to plant the American flag here because we don't, we don't, we're not protecting um, drilling for more oil, protection from deadly heat waves, combating crop failure and hunger, fighting climate-related diseases. Now, all of these things, including the last one, which is ice cream, uh, are areas where we have allies. So a big ice cream maker out there that's going to sell more when we confront climate change, if we survive for a while, is Nestle. Uh, and Nestle has made major investments anticipating that people are going to want more bottled water and more ice cream moving forward as the temperatures get warmer. So for me, these intersections, as difficult as it can be to find the time and to develop the allyships and to have the conversations, are places that we can attend to. So that it is immigration, or it is LD 1781, or it is Nikki Sakara and her anti-stolen spring, you know, stolen spring activities. But these things take time, and um, and we don't have it. I mean, we know we just got the UN report 2030. And we're already in trouble. We see that we're in trouble. Um, so I wish I had uh, an easy answer. Um, I think the answers are there, but we have a battle that we're all trying to take on in a variety of different ways. But I ultimately do come back uh, to hope. Uh, unfortunately, I think people will be hurt more than they already have been. But my hope is that all of this wakes us all up even more and, and we can take this on together. So I'll uh, pass on to Lisa. Um, so I want to thank George and Bob for speaking to us about their perspectives on this militarization problem that exists around the globe. Um, I was asked to bring it on home to Maine here uh, by the organizers of this event and talk about a specific resistance campaign that happened um, at the state level and to some extent at the local level, but it is inextricably tangled with the federal budget and the Pentagon's many, many, many very wealthy contractors. So um, I'm going to try to wing it as I talk so that I can show you my slides of a few visuals from this campaign. Um, a little bit of background here would be that I spoke with Shelley Pingree back when she first entered Congress as a fresh woman uh, representative. And I was working on the Bring Our War Dollars Home campaign at the time. She made a public appearance, and I uh, showed up and asked her, you know, if she was going to be trying to redirect federal resources from um, military spending. And she said to me, well, you know, that's what you go to Washington to do, but then once you get there, they, I assume she means lobbyists by that they, uh, ask you, what do you want to do, throw 3,000 people out of work your first term in office? They were referring to Bath Iron Works, which by then was owned by General Dynamics. And they were uh, referring to the usual argument which is made, it's not building weapons, it's a jobs program. Who could be against jobs? Um, so this is a, a typical tactic that the federal government uses at the state and local level, even at the city of Bath level, to uh, strong arm the taxpayers into basically providing the, the funding for corporate welfare. Essentially, uh, the LD 1781 was a bill that was submitted by um, a Representative Jennifer DeChant, a supposedly allegedly progressive Democrat that represents Bath and the surrounding area. And or the co-sponsor of the bill was Eloise Vitelli, who is a senator from, the state senator from that area. 
And this bill was written by Preddy Flaherty, which is the lobbying firm in Maine that, that works for General Dynamics, and then submitted by DeChant and Vitelli to the Maine legislature to give additional tax relief or a tax giveaway or a tax bonus, whatever you want to call it, to General Dynamics. Now, General Dynamics is a hugely wealthy corporation. I'm going to try to show a slide here. I hope I can. Um, showing how much money they have just to buy back their own stocks over the last few years, which is a, a pretty good measure of Yes, and you, and you get to see my cute little grandson. Can I get this slide to come up? Probably not, although I spent hours trying to get this to work. Let's see if I can get it this way. Let's try that. No. Okay, we'll try something else. How about this? No, it's not going to work. Well, I'll just have to give up. Um, so I'll look at my own slides and tell you what they look like. Being a teacher, it doesn't surprise me at all when the tech fails as soon as you have the audience in front of you. That always happens. So General Dynamics has spent $9.4 billion from 2013 to 2016 buying back their own stocks. I am not an investor, and I don't know duly about the stock market, but people who do understand this better have explained that that's how you drive up the value of a stock. If your company has, your corporation has so much profit, that you already have paid your chief executive, you know, 60 million, and you've already given everybody big bonuses, and they've all gotten new yachts, their third yacht, their fourth yacht. You still have a lot of money laying around? Buy back your own stock. For one reason, executive bonuses are tied to the value of the stock, so it's basically spending your profits to drive up your own salary. And also, um, it just increases its value on the, you know, on the stock market. Um, prior to 2013, General Dynamics had spent $3.5 billion buying back its own stocks. That was for the three years prior to that. So that, those stock buybacks went up by about 300% in the years just before this legislation was introduced. Now, General Dynamics was already getting tax breaks from the city of Bath. And several of our friends in the city of Bath had vigorously resisted those tax breaks and had some success in getting the original amount asked for reduced by some amount that I'm not clear on. Probably Leslie could provide those numbers. That had already happened, and the state of Maine had already long since passed legislation giving tax breaks to corporations like General Dynamics operating Bath Ironworks. So this was an attempt to renew some of the tax breaks that were about to expire and extend them for another 20 years down the road. And the original ask was $60 million, and it was to be funded by allowing Bath Ironworks to uh, deduct uh, payroll for state taxes from its employees, from its workers, and then not pass that money on to the state of Maine. So that didn't sit well with people that were paying a little bit of attention. And in the end, the, um, after a lot of pressure, which I'll talk about in a minute, the bill was, the legislation was revised to ask for a 45 million break, and it was not going, it was no longer going to be funded from payroll tax deductions. It would be, I, I think, a reduction in the state income tax that BIW would have to pay, General Dynamics would have to pay. So, this resistance campaign was not successful in keeping the legislation from passing, but it did have an effect on reducing the amount uh, down to like 75% of the original ask and um, restructuring some of the way that that uh, money was going to come into General Dynamics coffers. So one of the things that uh, this campaign did was bring a lot of different people together from different walks of life uh, Bob Klotz and 350 Maine got very involved. Um, a journalist from Rhode Island got very involved. A young man who um, had been investigating General Dynamics' strong arming of state legislatures in Rhode Island, where he lived, and also Connecticut. And so he had written some articles about that and published them in the Providence Journal. And I think that Bruce Gagnon reached out to Alex Nunes and said, hey, you've been researching this. We're involved in this resistance campaign here in Maine. You know, what can you tell us? How can you help us? Well, Alex News really is a true investigative reporter and had done a lot of homework. 
And one of the things that he did for us during the campaign is he filed a freedom of Info access to information request with the um, with Representative DeChant and with Senator Vitelli asking to see any correspondence between them and Bath Ironworks. And indeed, did get emails from Vice President of Bath Ironworks, John Fitzgerald, and Jennifer DeChan, who um, they were, they had a lot of conversations back and forth about how to make sure that the legislation got passed and also how to avoid the resistance that they clearly knew they would encounter. Um, one of the things that they did, and one of the visuals I wanted to show you uh, is related to this, is one of the claims that Fitzgerald made to DeChant, whose constituents, remember, are the people who might be objecting, um, was that Bruce Gagnon, who's an organizer, very active organizer against militarization there in Bath, was a one-man band. So this blatant lie that was told by the IW executive to uh, the state representative was meant to minimize the effect of constituents saying, hey, wait a minute, I'm not okay with this. And it kind of galvanized me into action because I'd been organizing with Bruce for a while. I knew scores of people that felt as he did, as I did, as my husband did, um, about this kind of tax boon for corporations. And so I started collecting names of people that wanted to say, well, I'm with Bruce on this. He's not a, and I made a little cart, like a political cartoon of a band being led by a banner that said no on LD 1781. And I could barely list all the names of all the people that came forward on, you know, a, a kind of a share it on Facebook kind of format um, cartoon. I didn't have room for the list of the 17 organizations around the state that also came out and said we are opposed to this legislation. So that wasn't the only lie that was told in this campaign. You might be surprised to hear. Um, my husband is uh, self-employed and um, is a woodworker. And when he's in between jobs, he has time on his hands. And we live about an hour from Augusta. So Mark and, again, scores of people, many of them sitting in this room, spent days going to Augusta, sitting in the taxation committee hearings um, about the bill, uh, lobbying as citizens in the halls, buttonholing representatives and senators as they went by. You know, and they were operating at a disadvantage because Pretty Flaherty is like buying them, you know, a trip to the Caribbean so they can get a nice tan. Our rep had just come back from the Caribbean, Brad Farron. I don't know who paid for his trip. Um, but, you know, that's who you're competing with is the guys in the $500 shoes that have bought many, many things for lawmakers in Maine and will continue to buy many, many things for lawmakers in Maine. And there you are, you know, Joe or, or Jill Citizen from Seoul and Maine saying it's not right and, you know, I want you to listen to your constituents. So one of the interesting things that happened is one of the biggest union at BIW failed to endorse the bill. But the legislatures, legislators were told, and I know this was a bipartisan problem because our legislator, our representative Brad Farron is a Republican, and other Democratic representatives said that in the Democratic Congress in the main legislature, they were told every union at BIW has endorsed this bill. Well, that was a blatant lie because S6 did not endorse the bill. They held a membership meeting, they debated it hotly, it was a split vote, and they declined to endorse it. But our representative reacted with alarm when told this by Mark. He immediately pulled out his phone and began scrolling frantically and then assured Mark, oh no, they just haven't endorsed it yet. So that's what the Republicans were being told, while the Democrats were told it had already happened. This was happening just as the bill was emerging from the taxation committee with an ought to pass um, and going to a floor vote where it passed handily. I think only 17 of Maine's representatives in the House found the courage, or whatever you want to call it, to vote no on the bill. And it passed easily, and it passed even more easily in the Senate, which is even more deep in the pockets of corporations. And you know, would you have expected our governor to not sign a corporate welfare bill? You know, boom, it was a done deal. But this was a very interesting campaign to me because um, it brought together a lot of different people that work in uh, different areas, such as Maine Equal Justice Partners, who are advocates for the poor in Maine. Uh, you know, I was able to use their help and research to be able to quantify, I'm a school teacher in a very poor school district in central Maine, 
How many children are growing up in poverty in Maine? 43,000 children right now are growing up in dire poverty in Maine, extreme poverty, below the federal poverty line, which is pretty darn low to begin with. But we could afford to give $45 million to a corporation that pays its CEO millions every year, even before bonuses. Um, the campaign also brought a lot of people out to lobby their legislators, maybe people that don't customarily contact their reps and their senators, and it brought out a lot of citizen journalists, which excited me, because I am a citizen journalist, and I had my op-ed about the bill turned down by both the Bangor Daily News and the Kennebec Journal. I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> really, because they had already published so many letters to the editor by people in opposition to this bill all over the state. They finally just stopped publishing them. I'm sure they heard from their board of directors that like, hey, you can't, you know, poke the bear of general dynamics or it will, you know, bite us back. Don't be doing that. So that was really interesting. The other thing I want to say before ending is a variety of tactics were employed, and one of the most powerful was Bruce Gagnon's hunger strike. He decided that he would go on hunger strike, and he would leaflet at the gates of Bath Ironworks during the noon uh, shift change, during the time that the bill was before the legislature, and he had vowed not to eat until it came to a vote, either yay or nay, on the floor of the House, on the floor of the you know, legislature. In the event, he kept it up for, I believe, 66 days. He, on medical advice, he finally abandoned the fast because he was starting to experience some really adverse effects. Um, and, but one of the other things that happened is another uh, uh, faith-based organizer in Maine organized a whole bunch of people to fast with him. So there were uh, several people, I think at last count I had seen, there were like 28 people signed up to fast in solidarity with Bruce. Not every single day, but um, they were supporting that effort as well. So, you know, the communication workers like myself, we did our communication work. The citizen lobbyists like my husband, he did his citizen lobbying work. The faith-based people like Leslie, they did their work with their organizations and getting the word out and so forth. Um, and it was a very interesting opportunity to have those conversations that Bob was talking about. Um, it was a really good opportunity to be able to talk with people about things that they normally don't want to think about and don't want to talk about. But there's no one in Maine who isn't mad about the state of the roads. You know those potholes? They wreck your car. They, you know, they're full of water. You can't even tell how deep they are. Every single Mainer cares about stuff like that, and they're usually pretty appalled to hear that an already very wealthy corporation is about to get a $60 million tax break. So it was a useful campaign in that sense, and I'm grateful because it expanded my uh, idea about what is war tax resistance. And I think Jenny or Jason or whoever, Morgana or whoever decided, hey, this is also war tax resistance for pointing that out to me. And for me, uh, the campaign that you just shared, Lisa, was one of the most impressive things I've ever uh, experienced. Uh, I think that it had a wide range of people involved. It had a wide range of tactics. It didn't, I have been in rooms with dozens and dozens of people and flip charts and multiple colored markers and hours and hours and hours of planning a campaign and so forth. And this had none of it. It was people getting on the phone or email or showing up in the halls of the state house and just taking action. I'm not criticizing that other approach, but th this was uh, just such an impressively organic and I think effective uh, process. I mean, uh, you know, to have saved the state $15 million is not a minor thing. Uh, and we, I, I think there were numerous other nuances, many of which I forgot, it feels like it's so long ago, but um, in, including going to multiple hearings. I think these people thought this bill was just gonna slip through and we slowed it down. And, and I, again, I'm proud to be part of that we because it was a, it was a genuine citizen-led effort to say, you're not getting away with it this time to this degree. So it cost them both the legislators who were trying to push this through and general dynamics, a, a significant uh, chunk of change in time and, and uh, I, I think it deserved, a lot of people deserve a lot of credit for that, so. 
Yeah, I would like to also to thank Lisa for the information that she just shared with us. And I, uh, coming from DRC Congo, living there for a very long time, and coming here and also trying to adjust to the new freedom and liberty that we enjoy here every day, I am shocked to see that there are people who are laying back and letting everything play by itself, not taking action. So seeing what you're doing to save people's money and, and trying to direct the money back to the community and investing in other things, the important thing, just amazing. And one of the things that I truly believe, I believe in awareness. And I don't know if you've seen this newspaper, I'm Jumbo Africa, it's all about awareness. And what, what I believe in is that once people are aware of the issue, that's the beginning of the solution. And I can also, I, was, I like quoting people who, for wise people, but one of the other saying of Socrates says, he said that the good thing that, that they ever happen is the knowledge, and bad thing that can ever happen to somebody is ignorance. So think about it. So it's just like laying other people leading our lives, it's not, it's not a good thing, and people do that out of ignorance. So when people are aware of their responsibility, but also actions that they can take to stop uh, things they would, or to make changes in their society, it's a very important. And I wish your group of campaigning can even involve more people, because there are people who don't know about this action. So it's, uh, uh, let me just give you an example. Last July was also, approached by another organization called Results. Have anybody know about Results? It's a similar to what you're doing. It's just campaigning uh, to the representative and changing policies that are, uh, that are going to change uh, the poverty, uh, global health, and also uh, economic opportunity. So, so that everyone has the same equal opportunity for accessing resources. Because you, as you know, there's huge gap between those who have a lot and those who don't have it. So, Awareness is very important, and thank you, Lisa, for what you're doing, and I hope you can involve more people and, and to be a campaign like that. Thank you. George, um, I wanted to ask you, um, I, I'm not sure if it's because I was a big reader or a history major as a, an undergrad, or if it was because I grew up during a time when they still showed the Vietnam War on television, but for some reason, I always had a strong sense of what you were trying to tell us, like, if you've ever lived through war, you don't. It may have even been from my family, because my grandfather almost died in World War I, and he told my father, do not believe them when they say the next war is a good one. There is no such thing. Please do not enlist, and so on. And my father, you know, passed that along to us. But what I'm wondering, George, is so how do we get people to realize that uh, militarism is a great risk to their safety, their quality of life, even if they can't see it right here in their immediate area, that investing so much of our um, resources as a nation in killing other people, mostly innocent people, for, you know, vastly, how do we get people to see that and care about that? I, it's always been a mystery to me why people don't care about that or worry about it. That's a very good question, but uh, I mean, the, the fear about, so everything is about fear. So we fear our neighbor, as our country neighbors, and they are going to attack us one day and we'll be capable of defending ourselves. That's the general idea about the army and multiplying, investing in the army and more weapons. So that's one thing that the politicians are very good at. It's convincing you that we are doing our best to protect our country, our freedom, our liberty, and therefore we have to invest in the in, 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 in army and also in, in, in be ready when that happens. But what we need to realize is that we don't invest as much effort as into creating peace and putting guide, you know, guidance and, and, and you know, policies that are preventing us from one country attacking another country, also within our country promoting peace making sure that whenever there's a conflict about to rise up, we are able to stop it. So one of the things that I think, you know, again, I, I can't, there's no magic bullet I can say, but it's a, it has to do empowering people to know what the government is doing, 
but also making sure that we also are able to be in the process of uh, promoting peace here, uh, locally, but also around the world. So it, it just we have to be aware of that and knowing what the government is doing, but also making sure they're also participating in promoting peace rather than just promoting the army and, and, and weapons and all other things. That, nuclear weapons is one of the things that I could share with you what it has done in the country of the Congo. How many people know that the, the bomb that uh, was used to bomb Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the raw material came from DRC Congo. Anybody know about that? Yeah, very good. So if you, I can, uh, I can uh, ask you to read a, a book called The Spies in the Congo. And it was about all the history, how the U.S. was exploding in the middle of the uranium in the Congo and we are doing the Manhattan Project. So it's so those are the things that the fear is a horrible thing to have. And once the fear is there, people can do anything. Just thinking they are protecting themselves, whereby people could be investing in just promoting peace around here and around the world. So again, there's no like a clear question to answer, but I, I believe that once we're aware of what we need to do, we can do more and stop the conflict around the world. So before we open it up uh, to other questions, I, I would like to comment on how important education and awareness is. And one of the things that we don't teach ourselves or our children is how to handle conflict. We don't do conflict resolution or conflict transformation, for example, in our homes very well. And we certainly don't offer it in our schools. But how might this world be changed if starting with maybe preschool children, working all the way up to middle, middle school children, we give children the tools that they need to deal with conflict in their own lives, in their own classrooms, and as they go out into the world. I mean, there's something that most of us can get behind that should not take an overwhelming amount of effort to introduce into the curriculum. We've seen the ill effects of bullying, isolation, otherness in our communities and in our schools. So some of the most effective violence prevention programs, and we know this from domestic violence, we know this from anti-gun violence, we know this from workplace violence, is education and awareness. Is it possible for us as mayors to ask our legislators after they are elected to introduce mandatory conflict transformation as part of our curriculum the same way that we mandate mathematics or main history? I mean, why not? What have we got to lose? I do believe that young people that I, that I know are far less enthralled to the belief in this horrible militarized economy that we've built, but they have been deliberately shackled with student debt so that they are unable to act as freely as they might have without that. But you know how it is, it just takes, it just takes a change in consciousness in a moment and the, the real, the most effective way we can bring down the militarized economy is stop supporting it. All of us just step away and let it fall. Um, it's scary and dangerous to think about, but I may not live to see it, but I firmly believe it will happen eventually if humans don't come to a more dramatic end before that happens. But, you know, young people, I don't see that they really believe, they've been brainwashed to think that if they appear unpatriotic, God will strike them down. But that doesn't mean they believe in the, in the current system. Sorry, that was too pessimistic. Yeah, I can't really uh, speak to the tax resisting. I can speak to the energy of the young people and the creativity. Uh, certainly in my work with the climate work, I mean, 350 was uh, developed by students from Middlebury College in Vermont. Uh, McKibben was one of their instructors. Um, and, you know, in its early days, and, and I still, and still, 350 was very creative in terms of, 
mean, part of the reason I was inspired to come back to Maine was I was one of 12,000 people circling the White House protesting the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, and it just got people mobilized, and, and young people were a very good part of that. And as we have put on events across the state, uh, it, it, there has been a very core um, university based and then we moved into high schools and you know there's been great local uh, activity with the young people there also has been a disconnect because um, you know we're all busy and how do you how do you have this dialogue and develop these relationships um, I have an essay I've written just to, again to be a little negative uh, it's titled I survived the circular liberal firing squad um, because everybody's got an opinion and there are egos and, and to be honest there's a lot of frustration and anger that things uh, have not changed and it brings me back to Leslie's comments about um, about conflict and this is very much my intention in the last couple of years to uh, shift from day-to-day -day development organizing climate change uh, activities to trauma and addiction because I think that's the disease that we are paralyzed by in this country. And I think that uh, there is a lot of pain there. And unless we have healing there, we're not going to be able to have these effective conversations and have these um, uh, effective actions. Uh, because people are afraid and people are in pain. Uh, and people don't trust each other, and people, you know, just silo into all kinds of different camps, whether it's uh, young people uh, or, or others. And um, I have a program I, I uh, offer uh, called Conflict Resolution, but I like the conflict transformation because that's the intent: is we need to we need to move beyond uh, this this culture that's. That's all about conflict and trauma. So. I can just say to uh, just responding to Samantha a little bit about the what youth uh, can do. This reminds me about the proverb uh, it's a, in, the, in the Bible that says that the beauty of the youth is their energy, but the beauty of the grown-up person people is their wisdom. So if the grown-up people can make an effort and really have a commitment to change, to turn the energy of the young people they have into a positive way, that can change the whole entire world. So, and I'll give you an example for DRC Congo. Some of the people who are involved in the killing and massacring people are the young people. So that means their mind has been changed, uh, but they oriented it to an evil thing, and killing people and destroying things. So what we need to be, uh, when, as a, to do, be doing as a society, is making sure that we, uh, we know the needs of our young people and how to channel the energy to a positive force that is going to change, make some changes in our society. I truly believe that that's possible if we start by our own kids, I have my 10 year old son, and every time I take a time and sit with him and showing him like conflict position, if somebody is attacking you, bullying you, what do you do? Those skills, like the same way we train them how to like, do the math and readings and cooking and other chores, we can do the same thing into a civic engagement, but also awareness of what they need to do and the responsibility that is rising ahead of them. It's a very important thing. wanted to um, invite Morgana if she has anything uh, to offer on this subject since she has been spending a great deal of her time uh, working on behalf of war tax resistance with uh, young people and college students. Well, um, I guess I, this is actually something that I think a lot about myself. I hear a lot of people that are older than me talking about how there's no young people in the peace movement. And I don't think that's true. I think what has happened is the particular kinds of oppression that are most visible 
are happening within the United States and not in other countries. You know, we don't have the same media that's telling us um, what's going on around the world. Our media is mostly in the country. And so, in my mind, a lot of um, racism and economic exploitation are what allows us to go destroy other countries. And I think that it's really important. I see most young people fighting against those rather than what's going on outside. Um, and they're both important. Um, so I guess my, what I would say is that I don't think that there is, I don't think it's true that young people don't care about peace issues. I see young people that care about peace issues all the time. It just looks different. And I also think that, um, sorry, I'm not, I'm not really comfortable speaking to people. I've, I've lost my train of thought, but um, if, I, if I come back to the other point, I'll, I'll raise my hand again. Um, the Poor People's Campaign was originally conceived of by Martin Luther King in 1968, prior to his death. And I want you to look at the pictures on the wall of this room, which is named for Jerry Talbot. Now, Jerry is still with us. And the work that he has done from the 50s right through the 90s is with us, too. Jerry and his family were instrumental in the founding of the NAACP in Maine. He was the first person of color to be elected to the Maine State Legislature. And in the early 1970s, he addressed the issues of fair housing, racial discrimination, and equal rights for lesbian and gay people in Maine in the 1970s. This room is a testimony to what true believers can accomplish. This room is located in the business school of the University of Southern Maine. I think that tells us a lot about where our interests can join. 50 years or so after the formation of the Poor People's Campaign, Dr. William Barber, a black Baptist preacher out of North Carolina and head of the NAACP in North Carolina organized something we called Moral Mondays. The legislature was so out of control that people of faith and people of conscience across the state of North Carolina sat in at the state house and got arrested week after week after week because they were opposed to the kind of transformation that the Republican-controlled legislature was trying to make in North Carolina. And on the basis of that, this Moral Movement Monday program spread to the rest of the Southeast and became something that a lot of us took great hope from. That effort has coalesced into a revival of the Poor People's Campaign based in no small part on the sermon that Dr. King gave at the Riverside Church in 1967 when called Beyond Vietnam, which was his outspoken opposition to the war of Vietnam and to the increasing militarization of the United States. And at that time, Dr. King warned us against three evils that would bring this country down. They were racism, they were militarism, and they were rampant consumerism. And his words are probably as true today as at the time he spoke them. So the Poor People's Campaign is getting organized here in Maine as well as in many other states. And the things that they are addressing include systematic racism, poverty and inequality, ecological devastation, war economy and militarism, and national morality. A nation that finds money for bombs, but never enough money for bread or health care or education 
for peacemaking. So for those of you who are interested, there's material about Poor People's Campaign available, and I would encourage you to look at their principles and see if this is a place where we as activists and concerned citizens can intersect with others who share our values in a nonpartisan, multipartisan attempt to address the evils let's call them what they are, the evils raised by Dr. King. Militarism, racism, and consumerism. rampant <laughs> consumerism. We're facing a midterm election in which our entire legislature is up for office. Now, when legislators are newly elected, the way our system works here in Maine is they have to put in bills at the beginning of the first year of the session that get heard over the course of the session and into the next year. Would it be helpful to find some legislators after they're elected in November to see if they would sponsor legislation that would require, not just allow, but require both sides of recruitment and counter-recruitment to take place. Now, we may have to ramp up our resources if that bill passes, but rather than facing opposition from a concerned school administration or a resistant school board, let's, is there any value to actually requiring it under the law? It's the state that makes the mandates for the education system in Maine. Lisa. Well, I hate to be cynical, Leslie, but the Maine legislature long since passed a law that the state must provide 55% of the funds for basic education uh, here in Maine. They have moved farther and farther from that 55% every year since that law passed. And I'll just cite another education-related law that I think is very seldom observed, and that is that there's a law in the books that every grade of every school must teach Maine Native history and culture. Those of you that have gone to Maine schools or worked in Maine schools, is that happening? So forgive me if I don't think putting a law on the books, an, another unfunded mandate on you know chronically underfunded public education systems is likely to have a huge effect. Really parents going to the school board and pitching a fit is the only thing that really changes practices in public schools in Maine, in my experience. Because one of my favorite experiences was sitting in the courthouse in Bath after one of the, um, at one of the arrests and the, the trial. The judge was uh, the former chief legal counsel for the Maine Republican Party and had been the chief general counsel to the new to uh, Governor LePage when uh, LePage was first elected. So we did not have high hopes of that experience of the trial, but uh, Jason told one of our favorite stories that day, and it certainly had an impact on the jury. In 1848, a young writer was sitting behind bars because he refused to pay the poll tax that indirectly helped support the United States incursion into Mexico, which is considered by many to be one of the landmarks, benchmarks in our timeline about American imperialism. And his best friend took the train from Boston out to pay his respects to the incarcerated writer and said to him, David, what are you doing in there? And Henry David Thoreau said to Ralph Waldo Emerson, Ralph, what are you doing out there? And that's the question we all hold in our hearts. Am I doing everything I can? Small victories, baby steps, 
sitting down with people with whom we do not normally agree and finding common ground. Supporting each other when the times get pretty discouraging. And remembering that it doesn't take an army of people to change the world. It never has. Margaret Mead reminds us regularly. And it never will. But each of us is called in his or her own way to do what we can, where we can, when we can. And that we can all do. Thank you. Merci.